live. Oh, no. Boom. I'm going to start singing. Oh, no, please don't. As, we, <laughs> as we're live for our Good Gut Live. Now, this is a monthly Good Gut Live for our Good Gut members, and you all get to listen in. So if you're not a Good Gut member, thank your Good Gut members who are part of our practice, typically patients, and they join our Good Gut membership, and we answer their questions live. And if you're watching on Instagram, YouTube, and other Facebook groups or areas in Facebook, you get to just listen into this. So we're really happy to be here. If there's time at the end, we answer your questions as well. So from Instagram, Facebook, and YouTube. So uh, again, if you're watching this live, if you do have questions, still comment down below. Let us know your questions because that gives us inspiration for maybe another Good Gut Live topic that we'll do. Um, I'm, seeing a, I'm seeing a question come in. How do you become a Good Gut member? Wonderful question. Typically, you register through our practice, and you can fill out our Good Gut membership, and you become a Good Gut member. Mm -hmm. So it's it's that easy. And again, majority, I'd say 99% are patients who just want a Good Gut membership in addition, in addition to being a patient. But you don't technically have to be a patient, and you'll get access to our private group. You'll get access to a lot of great discounts, unlimited messaging, and more, as well as getting first dibs on questions when it comes to our good gut live. So, and a bunch, a bunch of other perks. So again, you can learn more about that on marytoth.com or when you register for our practice, one of, uh, one of our team members would be happy to answer those questions. So uh, today's topic is all about elemental diets. We, we got this question come in uh, from our good gut members. We've been seeing this a lot ourselves from our patients, from we're on like different email lists as well on our personal emails. We've just been seeing a lot going around on elemental diet, elemental diet, buy the elemental diet. Here's this great company that sells elemental diet. Um, thank you. I'm seeing that you guys rock. You rock too. <laughs> um, and we just wanted to answer some questions. And again, if you have questions, comments, drop them down below. We'd love to check them out. Mm -hmm. We do have just some basic questions from our Good Gut members that we thought all of you would really enjoy seeing. One being like, is an elemental diet good for SIBO? Um, what exactly is an elemental diet? Um, I've, I've, if I've been on an elemental diet before, is it good to keep doing elemental diets? So th these are the big three questions that we got. And these are pretty general questions that we thought, again, all of you would really enjoy. For those that don't know, my name is James Marin. I'm an integrative registered dietitian, environmental nutritionist, and the co-founder of Mary to Health, which is a registered dietitian private practice where we see patients all over the world, and we have a total of seven integrative dietitians. Mm -hmm. And I'm Dolly Marin. I'm also an integrative gut health dietitian with a special plant-based focus. I'm one of the co-founders of Married to Health as well and our resident SIBO IBS expert in the practice. Yeah, yeah. So uh, we felt it was appropriate to discuss this topic because mm -hmm. it's been coming up. Like James has said, you know, I think it depends on the person's personality, but I would say most people who transition mm. to wanting to try an elemental diet, try it because they've tried a lot of other things and they're not finding that relief or they're not putting their SIBO into remission. Some people just try it off the bat and they're like, I got diagnosed with this thing, this thing called SIBO. I don't want to do a special diet or take medication and do other things. I want to try something that has about an 80% chance of putting me into remission. So this is what I'm going for, but we mm -hmm. wanted to answer all of your questions that you all had about what the elemental diet is, who it's appropriate for, who it's not, what are the pros and cons of it, and everything you've ever wanted to know or not know about an <laughs> elemental diet. And if you're like, oh, this is a born elemental diet, I don't even know what that is. This applies to you though. If you're if you're having gut issues, if you know someone mm -hmm. with gut issues, maybe you're not, maybe you have no idea what an elemental diet is, but like we've said many, many times before, and we'll keep saying it, if you're having uh, gut irregularities, if you're what's called gut dysbiosis, which means like I'm, I'm frequently bloated, I'm frequently constipated, I frequently have diarrhea, or maybe it goes off and on, and I just have gut issues, I don't feel okay in my gut, we highly recommend you get that taken care of now because g gut issues are a snowball effect. It starts out with just a little bit constipation here and there, turns into IBS, and IBS can turn into IBD, which is inflammatory bowel, di bowel disease. And so it's very important that you don't let it snowball out of control where it gets to a place where your autoimmune system is now wreaking havoc on your GI tract. And 
the list goes on and on. So, mm-hmm. so let's start with what is the elemental diet and go from there. Yeah. So the elemental diet is basically a formula. It's a powder that is just straight macronutrients. So it's the basic element. So you're just getting straight fat. You're getting straight amino acids, which are protein building blocks. And um, there are no protein peptides included in that. So they're short amino acid chains um, and individualized amino acids without chains rather. Um, So they're just individual amino acids and then very simply broken down carbohydrates. So the Mm -hmm. carbohydrates are even also broken down into just glucose. Some of them have dextrose, some of them are dextrose free um, or maltodextrin. So you're just getting those basic elements and then some added vitamins and minerals as well. There are some electrolytes included in some of the formulas that are commonly out there. what you did not hear that these include are any starches. So there's no FODMAPs that are available in the elemental formulas. There's no fiber in the elemental formula. There's no... Um, Phytonutrients yeah. in elemental formulas. There's there's no microbial activity in elemental formulas, right? So there's a lot in food that's not in an elemental formula. And that's kind of the point. You're really like... It's almost like being in solitary confinement or going into like your... Uh, What's that like panic room in your house? Well, it's like danger, danger. And you just go into this confined space where you you tried to be in control and you're kind of away from the outside world. In this case, the outside world being food. Food is a connector to the outside mm-hmm. world. There's microbes, there's polyphenols, there's fiber, there's bacteria and fungi and viruses all in food. And this is going, nope, we're just giving you the basics to survive cellularly uh, Mm -hmm. pretty much is an elemental diet. And the reason why somebody would want to do that, because I think for a lot of people listening who can't relate, they're like, why would I want that? (laughs) You're on a powdered formula, liquid formula for two, sometimes three weeks, depending Mm -hmm. on the case. And the reason somebody would possibly consider going on an elemental diet is because one, it decreases that those bacteria and other microbes live in the small intestine. If you're just giving the basic elements, they're immediately going to get digested and absorbed in the small intestine. There's nothing there that needs to break down fermentation, digestion. Um, You're immediately taking up those nutrients into your cells. Mm -hmm. So you're bypassing a lot of those processes that then cause gas as a byproduct. If somebody has an overgrowth of hydrogen, of methane, hydrogen sulfide in their small intestine, they're not getting fed. So studies have shown that there is an 80, 80% chance of going into remission with SIBO and you know, we do know SIBO comprises a majority of IBS. Somebody has a high risk of putting their SIBO into remission and getting over their SIBO with an elemental diet, at least in the short term. They have shown with three weeks for those with methane, which is a little bit more stubborn, there is also 85% chance that that could resolve it and alleviate their bacterial overgrowth or microbial overgrowth. So that would be an incentive for someone to want to do this, where you know, there's also variable rates of how the antimicrobials work or how medications work, but this just starves the microbes. So they're no longer there. They, they die after those two to three weeks. Mm-hmm. And that sounds great. But also realize that while they're dying in the small intestine, they're dying in the large intestine. And Remember, not all bacterial overgrowth is overgrowth of inflammatory or dangerous bacteria or unwanted bacteria. Mm -hmm. Sometimes it's your perfectly healthy anti-inflammatory microbes and bacteria that overgrew in the small intestine. And so when you're killing them and starving them in the small intestine, they can also be killed and starved in the large intestine. Right. So, so this sounds good. It's like, let's, let's do it. Everyone should be on an elemental diet who's having gut issues and symptoms, especially SIBO and IBS. And so like Dahlia is saying there in those first two to three weeks, you're on it. I mean, you're going to, I think you're going to feel really good. I think you're going to feel like, great. All my symptoms are gone. And, and maybe you enjoy just drinking liquids and you're like, I feel leaner. Maybe you might lose weight and that's great. And I feel wonderful. 
Um, the big question the context want to give and, and give more insight into what's going on is then going, what happens after those three weeks, let's say? What happens in three months? What happens in six months? What happens in nine months, 12 months, and for the rest of your life, right? Mm -hmm. And so um, there are studies on that. There are, there are longer term prospective studies that go, well, great. We're, it's looking like around 80% of those that could be IBD or IBS. When they go on an elemental diet, they feel better. They report their symptoms improving to you know significant symptom improvement to, to having no symptoms. But then in about six months or more, I don't know, I think the cough was six months, about 67% and probably more as other studies are coming out, 67 plus percent report their symptoms come right back after six months. And we're not looking at the nine months and 12 months and further down the line. So, and also we have to think of the elemental diet was this magic pill or silver bullet. And don't get us wrong, it has a place but if it was this end all be all, I mean, that would be it, right? There would be no more C by BS. I mean, everyone just goes on an elemental diet and they're good. Um, it's more of what is my plan after the elemental diet, right? I'm using this elemental diet. First and foremost, why am I using the elemental diet? And then two, what is my plan after the elemental diet? Because you're definitely not going to drink the elemental powders for the rest of your life. So what is your plan? These are the big questions that we just want to bring awareness on. This is maybe you've heard of the elemental diet, maybe you haven't, but it's all geared towards, I want to alleviate my symptoms. I don't want to have my symptoms anymore. So if you're feeling like, man, I'm bloated all the time and it hurts, or I have foul smelling gas all the time and it's embarrassing and it's hurting my dating life and my relationships, or you're having diarrhea. Again, let's bring this into context because these are our patients. You know, we, we've, we're very intimate with these symptoms and, you know, or you're constipated and you're feeling sick. And I worry about colon cancer because we know constipation increases your risk of colon cancer. Let's, that, that's the goal, right? You just, you don't want these symptoms anymore. But we also want to bring awareness and educate on the fact of you don't just want these symptoms gone for three weeks or a couple of months. You want them gone for the rest of your life, right? So that's really what we're trying to get at. So hopefully you resonate with that and understand where we're coming from. So. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I think it's important then now that we've kind of presented what the elemental diet is, um, and who might go for it. Like we said, it could be that person who's like, I just got diagnosed with SIBO. I just want mm -hmm. it out of my system. Maybe it's someone who's like, I'm going on the trip of a lifetime in a month and I don't want to take SIBO with me on my trip. Yeah. Um, so even if it comes back, that's okay with me. I'd rather just not take it with me traveling. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it could be for the person who's been a SIBO veteran and living with SIBO for a long time. Maybe they haven't identified their root cause, or maybe they have, and it's just one that's tricky, that's going to live with them for the rest of their life. Mm -hmm. Maybe they have post-infectious gastroenteritis that really isn't being alleviated with pro-motility agents, pro-kinetics. Maybe they have a neurodegenerative disease that affects the way that the nerves are working in their brain and in their gut. Maybe they have um, something like Ehlers-Danlos syndrome or some form of dysautonomia. So that person mm -hmm. may very well continue to have SIBO relapse over and over and over because if these are structural things or the way that their anatomy and physiology is made up of, they're at risk for SIBO relapse. But if you're somebody who's saying, well, you know, at onset after I had food poisoning and I don't feel like I have any lingering effects from it, but it did induce SIBO in me, I just want to kind of get it out, then that might be the person who goes for this. Um, you know, I think it's really important to remember the risk factors. So we wanted to also present those because I think people see, oh, 80%, 80 to 85% remission. It could be over and done with this in two to three weeks. Let me do it. And there are cons. So you always want to have informed consent with anything that you're doing. You always want to know what you're getting yourself into. So we wanted to let you all know about some of the risks as well when it comes to going on an elemental diet and really just going for that elemental formula the whole time. And, you know, I am saying the whole time. Other things that one could include is um, 
you could include very weak coffee or tea as long as it's, there's nothing fermentable. So you probably wouldn't want to do like a dandelion tea or a chicory tea. Those things are a little bit more fermentable as well. So you probably would want to go for just a very light herbal tea or very weak coffee. You can add ice, you can add water, and you can add stevia leaf extract. You also probably don't want to use stevia leaf powder because it could have some fiber in there. So those would be things that can be included on an elemental diet. Some of the things that people should be aware of is, um, one, again, you're not eating and chewing for two to three weeks. So that could have its own implications on your jaw, your glymphatic system in your brain. And that is a system that helps to basically rid and drain stressful neurotransmitters and hormones that kind of can accumulate in the brain if you're in very stressed periods. That's really why a part of the reason why people bite their nails or clench their jaw or they crave grind their teeth, grind their teeth, crave crunchy, salty foods when they're super stressed. It's that glymphatic drainage. So if you're not doing that when you're eating, cause you're so you're simply only drinking something, mm-hmm. you know, that could play into that a little bit. Yeah. Um, other, other issues, the obvious would be weight loss, right? So if you're mm-hmm. underweight already, then maybe the elemental diet is something you want to be extremely, extremely cautious uh, with going on and consult your healthcare team or also look, if you're already underweight, you will will likely lose more weight. Mm -hmm. So that is something to be aware of. Um, It is also very stressful to your microbiome. So what we're finding is the obvious, right? The idea of FODMAPs and fiber and eating plant foods is that you're not just feeding your human cells, you're feeding your microbial cells. In the elemental diet, you are really not feeding your microbial cells. The microbes, for the most part, digest things that we cannot, polyphenols and different forms of fiber. When that's not available, those microbes who like to eat those things go, what the heck, I'm out of here, or they die and they're out of there without a choice. So you can um, further decrease your populations in your colon and all throughout your body, essentially, um, when you're on an elemental diet. So if you're already struggling with your microbiome and it's already in a weakened state, elemental diet will weaken it further. That's even more reason to really be aware of your time restraints and your, your time limit with the elemental diet. Elemental diet should not be long, a long-term diet, obviously, and it shouldn't be anywhere near, you know, a couple to several months. I mean, it's, it's very, very short-term. Yeah. And, you know, with being on a lot of people who do have SIBO, they've been on and off of restrictive diets. They mm-hmm. might have said, I've been low FODMAP five different times. I've gone low histamine. I've done low sulfur. I've done low fermentation. Right. And all of these different diets could be overwhelming, right? They could cause a lot of overwhelm, food fear. And this also could further exacerbate that. If somebody finds, oh, I feel amazing when I don't eat, when I'm on this elemental diet and I'm not bloated, that could also trigger disordered eating or re-trigger an old eating disorder because, again, then that sends the signal, food is bad. Mm -hmm. Food gives symptoms. I shouldn't eat food. I should really just want to live on this forever. And as we said, starving out who you don't want there in the upper digestive tract in the small intestine, but it will also starve out who you want there in the large intestine. So it's not long-term. It's not something someone should do more than once or max twice a year. Um, And if you do have history of eating disorder, you do want to talk to your care team about that to see if it's appropriate for you to be on an elemental diet. Mm -hmm. Um, And while you're on it, of course, it will have implications for your lifestyle. So like I was saying, you're not eating for two weeks. You're not chewing for two weeks that would make it hard probably for you to go out and socialize if you're like, well, it's someone's birthday and I'm invited to a dinner. Yes, you can still go. You still want to include social time in your life and you don't want to feel like, well, if I can't eat, I shouldn't go. Mm -hmm. We encourage you to still go, but know that that would be something you're not participating in. Um, And then you probably are going to feel quite fatigued. Mm -hmm. Um, One, again, because you're on a more restricted nutrition plan, Usually you're only eating enough calories as or drinking enough calories as are needed for your ideal body weight, not your current body weight. And so that's that weight loss that James was saying, but that can come with fatigue because 
overall, you're not intaking the same type of carbohydrates, the same types of fats, the same types of protein. Um, not only that, there is high risk of die off because as these microbes are dying, if there are inflammatory gut bugs, inflammatory microbes, as they die, they give you a little, they flip the bird to you and they release what's called an endotoxin. So they release lipopolysaccharide and other endotoxins that they were keeping, just keeping on reserve for you in case you tried to kill them. So that way you could have those die off symptoms that people talk about. Mm -hmm. And for some people, this just lasts for a few days or maybe the first week. For some people, they experience it the entire time. They mm -hmm. experience these die off symptoms for the first two to three weeks. And so that is not always the funnest place to be living. Yeah. Um, so that's really important to consider as well. Yeah. So, you know, and there's definitely bowel changes. There's other things going on uh, with the elemental diet, including you can see diarrhea. You can still have some symptoms as people report. And it's, and it's important to also understand electrolyte composition in the foods you're eating and what you're consuming. That will play into the diarrhea, constipation, and other issues that you can still have. So again, we like to think of or, you know, it's touted, especially when you go on different websites or who you're hearing from is like, yeah, the elemental diet's great. It might, you might not be in that 80% who actually feels better. You can be in the 20% who still has symptoms. And so not only you've gotten all kind of the cons, none of the pros, and you're still back where you started. So very, very important to understand what you're getting into. Like Dahlia mentioned that informed consent and knowing yeah. what is going on with this diet is very, very important. Because you could be one of the people who also feels great on it. So you never know, but yeah. it's so important for you to know and just be prepared. So other tips that I will give to my patients if they're considering an elemental diet or if they're curious about it, I will recommend that they drink it only through a straw and really try not to swish it around their mouth. If, if somebody already comes into it with pre-existing fungal overgrowth or yeast overgrowth, and then you're putting this glucose or dextrose or maltodextrin solution of sugar on your tongue, um, you can get oral thrush. So you can get yeast overgrowth in the mouth. So they do recommend drinking it just through a straw and not um, really swishing it around your mouth. And, um, and again, you want to try to make it taste good. So for some people, they'll make it into like a smoothie and they'll blend it with ice just so it has a little bit of a different texture. Some people like it warm. So it really depends on the person and how they prefer to drink a type of solution like this. I will say it's not the yummiest thing. <laughs> it's not meant to taste good because in order to make it taste good, you would need to add flavors and nutrients to it and that's not that's the opposite of what the goal we should is say nutrients found in food there's a reason why we use lots of onions and garlic and different vegetables and herbs in our food because it adds so many layers of flavor and really those flavors are different polyphenols and different uh, micronutrients in food that our body and our microbes just love. That's why we can smell and taste and do all these amazing things with food. And it nourishes our body, both physically, mentally, and emotionally, is because it's so deep rooted in our microbiome. And so when you're, when you kind of removed all of that, there are instances of depression and anxiety with the elemental diet as well. So many other layers in terms of mental health with the elemental diet as Dahlia touched on with eating, those with eating disorders or history of mental illness, depression and anxiety, that's also something to consider with the elemental diet. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. And I would say one of the last things to consider is other medications and supplements you're taking because certain medications and supplements have fermentable substrates in them. Some medications have lactose or if your supplements come in a cellulose fiber capsule, mm -hmm. that is a fermentable type of fiber. Um, if you're taking cellulose as your fiber agent to help you with your constipation, you really want to take inventory of what you're taking and what you should continue and what you, you should discuss with your care team that maybe you should take a pause on or understand the risks and benefits of continuing certain supplements or medications if you are intending to go elemental. Um, and once you have decided, if you are going to decide, again, you want to work with someone who's very familiar. So they make sure that you're drinking enough of the elemental formula every day. One of the biggest things I see is that people, one, don't calculate as much as they need because they're unfamiliar with how to calculate mm -hmm. their needs, how many scoops they need per day. And two, sometimes 
they it's so unpleasant and unpalatable they cannot finish their scoops for the day so sometimes someone needs 10 scoops in a day and they are only able to tolerate six so that's hundreds and hundreds of calories and tons of nutrients that someone might not be getting in if they are on an elemental diet that also is going to factor into all those other things, fatigue, weight loss, mental, emotional health. If you're not nourishing your body, you're not mm -hmm. getting in the nutrients that it needs that can have lasting effects. I think those have been the big questions from our good gut members. Um, mm -hmm. Overall, how are you feeling about the, so I know you touched on this, but elemental diet for SIBO IBS, the overall consensus is check in with your registered dietitian. It's mm -hmm. not a one size fits all. If you have SIBO and IBS and you're considering the elemental diet, it has to be right for your individualized case. It's not a one size fits all. That is the overall message here. Very, very important. You understand the pros and the cons, which we went over. If, if you know somebody who's considering the elemental diet, you can find this recording on our Instagram, but also on our YouTube channel. Feel free to send it uh, to a friend or family member who's considering the elemental diet so they can have some more context and more education and knowledge. Mm -hmm. We know that there's a lack in education and knowledge out there, especially when if someone's seen their care provider for five or 10 minutes and it's really quick or you're still figuring this out or you know, you're know you using Google and, and social media to try and piece together what's going on in your own health. You know, So we try to be a resource and a reference for everyone out there. But, um, but yeah, it's very nuanced. It can be uh, complex in some cases, easier in some. So again, it's important that you check in with yourself, with your own individualized needs, and then find a reputable and knowledgeable health professional to help guide you with this. That is mm -hmm. a very important aspect. Someone you can be checking in along the way, because if you're on day four and you start having issues, you want to make sure that your care team is available to support you with whatever is going on. So if you're yeah. like, yeah, my gastroenterologist recommended it to me or my dietitian recommended it to me, but I see them once every five months and they really don't answer my questions when I send them through the portal yeah. or to their office. You probably want to make sure you have someone on board who can be a resource when you're troubleshooting, when you're starting it, when you need to know how much to take and when you're coming off of it. Because as mm -hmm. you're coming off of it, you're going to need to know how to start eating again so you don't have refeeding symptoms. Mm -hmm. You really want to ensure that somebody can help guide you on how do you start eating food again? What order should you start eating things in again? And how is that going to feel for your body? I wanted to add one more thing. If you guys saw the thumbnail of this video, we have the elemental diet next to fertilizer. And you're probably wondering, what the heck did that mean? <laughs> so I wanted to address that. So the idea here is just like in monoculture crops, because I love, if you know us, and especially me, we love to give metaphors with the environment, because our gut is basically our inner ecosystem. It resembles our inner environment, and it reflects our outer environment. So when, when it comes to synthetic fertilizers, they're basically just uh, the basics of what soil and plants essentially need. So it's nitrogen, phosphorus, and, and other just basic potassium, right? Other just basic elements. So the, it's very different than having synthetic nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium versus actually composting and mulching and having a diverse array of different crops in a healthier farm, right? So if you look at a regenerative healthy farm versus like acres and acres of just corn, it's a very, very different ecology, right? The soil looks different. You can guess which soil is healthier. You know, we know the farm with diversity and, and undergoing really great practices has healthier soil. And that's what you essentially want for your gut, your gut lining, your gut structure. We don't want you to get stuck in a place where you're in, you've dug yourself a hole, you're losing diversity in your gut microbiome. And because of that, you have to then resort to the elemental diet. That is essentially, you know, you're keeping going down the path of, less and less diversity. So your basically your soil, your inner ecosystem, your gut cannot process these foods that have lots of nutrients and can help those microbes long term. You can really find yourself kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place where it's like, I can't digest this, but I need it. And therefore I can't digest it. So I have to go with something like the elemental diet, which at least I can absorb nutrients. 
that is hopefully a, a last resort. That's hopefully something you have to do, you know, or not hopefully have to do, but it's, it's hopefully something where you're at the end of the line, end of the rope, and this is the last resort. But there is hope. We bring a message of hope. We bring a message of hopefully understanding and context of going, you can use plants and all the beneficial nutrients and components of plants to rebuild your gut microbiome, to help with the structure of your gut. The science and research is becoming more and more clear on this, where you can heal with each meal. That is why we are big proponents of that. So hopefully this gave you just more knowledge about what the elemental diet is. If you think you're somebody who's a good candidate for it, reaching out to somebody who's knowledgeable about it to help mm -hmm. guide you through it if you do want to try it. Or even ask, I, you know, I had a patient ask me the other day, do you think I would be a good candidate for the elemental diet? And I was honest with her and I said, you know what? I don't think you would be because when you came to me a little bit of over nine months ago, you hadn't had a menstrual cycle for about a year mm -hmm. and you just got it back consistently. And this would tremendously stress your hormones and your gut again. And I don't think you would be a good candidate for this. So I think it's important to have somebody you trust and somebody you can ask those answers to. Uh, I know we got a few questions as we were chatting. So we want to okay. answer your guys' questions. I know this is kind of a more specialty topic, so it's not as appealing as bloating or constipation or things that other people experience more commonly, but we do want to answer the questions that we got outside of our good gut members. Yes. So we see thoughts on 72 hour fasting and dry fasting. Mm -hmm. So very interesting. So, and the different, the difference between dry fasting and just regular fasting is uh, just even limiting hydration, right? So um, yeah, it's very interesting. Very similar. I mean, you are kind of having the same very similar pros and cons where if you are fasting of any type, and especially if it's dry fasting, you are severely limiting what you're putting in your body and therefore what your microbes can consume when your microbes, microbes do not have a lifespan like we do. So many microbes have a short lifespan. So when they are starved, they're gone. And whether or not you will eliminate a population or decrease a population begins with how healthy your gut microbiome was uh, to begin with. And chances are, if you're considering fasting because of gut issues, your gut has already been stressed and is in dysbiosis. So fasting is not something you should do lightly. Um, we all do a form of fasting when we sleep. It's called sleeping. And so you want to just be better about time-restricted feeding. That is a fasting that we are behind every single day. Dolly and I personally fast anywhere from 12 to 16 hours a day. That's including our sleep. On average, we usually, yeah, like 14 at least. 14, yeah, because we usually start eating about 10 or 11, and we stop eating by usually 8 p.m., right? So, um, so about nine-ish hours eating in total. The rest of the time, we're fasting. So that is a fasting we highly recommend. Fasting in between meals is what we highly mm -hmm. recommend. You don't always, if you're not doing that, you don't have to go to this extreme of like, I'm going to fast for two weeks, dry fasting. It's like practice fasting every single day for that 12 to 16 hours and then see how you feel. And again, ask some questions to your care team. Something I always respond with when somebody asks me about that, because my patients ask me often too. Um, one, how do you think it would positively impact you versus negatively impacting you? Again, all those social emotional factors. And if you're somebody who says, oh yeah, I see mucus in my stool all the time, you mm -hmm. probably have a thin protective layer of mucus in your gut. Because mm -hmm. I always say this, people think the gut is this really strong organ. They'll say, I have a gut of steel. Um, but it's not. It's it's delicate. It's a hollow organ and it's one cell layer thick. So it's as thick as your skin. So in order to protect it, it's thinner. because it's so delicate, yeah, it's even thinner than your skin epidermis, mm -hmm. um, you need a thick protective layer of mucus. So if you're constantly feeling like, oh man, I always see mucus in my stool or sometimes I have inflammatory bowel disease and I just go and it's only mucus. Mm -hmm. You have a thin layer of protection. And if you're fasting and not feeding your gut bugs, especially if you have SIBO and you have an overabundance of these gut bugs, guess where they'll go for nutrients first because they're not getting it from food. They'll go for your mucus layer. So 
that could pose its own risks with autoimmunity and with leaky gut and symptoms that come with that. So not always the amazing resource that it seems like it is. I'm not saying never do it. But again, if you're somebody already underweight, if you're somebody who has disordered eating, if you're somebody who has a thin mucus layer already, I probably wouldn't get on board with that person doing dry fasting or 72 hour fasts like that. So you know, could, you could though, if it's for spiritual reasons, or you truly feel like you just need a break from eating, mm. um, work with your care team and see what they feel about it. So can a colonoscopy temporarily, temporarily relieve SIBO symptoms? Short answer, yes. Mm -hmm. And that's temp typically because of the colonoscopy prep. You are prepping for colonoscopy. Again, you're trying to you're trying to clean out the colon because you don't want a bunch of feces in there while they're trying to stick a camera and see what's going on. So you're doing a colonoscopy prep beforehand and that prep will clean you out. It washes out your microbiome. Right. So that's good. It can be good for some of the symptoms. You're like, whoa, I feel great. Could be bad because again, like Dolly said, you're kind of washing out your microbiome. So if your microbiome wasn't strong and well-rooted to begin with, Think of like a flood and some weak trees in a the flood. They're going, well, they're going right out with the water, right? As opposed to healthy soil where the roots are deep and the trees have been there a long time. And there's a flood that comes through and the trees are like, I'm good. I'm solid. Okay, some flooding. Great. So I'll bounce right back. I'll bounce right back and, and I'm good. I'm going to drop my seeds and plant more trees, right? So that's a strong gut microbiome versus a weakened gut microbiome. And so the colonoscopy prep, that's where some after colonoscopy are like, man, I have not felt the same. It's probably because you had issues before the colonoscopy. It's probably why you're getting a colonoscopy for those who are just not of the age to kind of check in. But um, if you're if you're getting younger, especially like in your 20s and 30s getting a colonoscopy, chances are you already have gut microbiome issues. Or risk factors. Or risk factors. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you And I've had careful. patients who have that happen, whether it's a positive experience for them, they'll say, oh yeah, for six weeks, I felt amazing. And then after that, all my symptoms came back. Or for some people, they're like, it's been six weeks and my gut has still not recovered. So mm -hmm. yeah, it could help temporarily, but hopefully you're not getting colonoscopies for that reason. Yeah. <laughs> or enemas. You're not giving yourself enemas for that reason. Right. All right. How Someone's asking, how many calories are usually consumed per day on the elemental diet? Just the shakes. Yeah. That is calculated based on someone's ideal body weight. So for example, there's 150 calories per scoop. Mm -hmm. If your ideal intake is 1,500 calories per day, you would intake 10 scoops per day. So it's going to vary depending on the person, their activity level, and their personal needs. Right. Great questions. Mm -hmm. Love me. I think we have just questions. a few more questions. And then we'll come okay. back to the next topic. What's, what's the best food slash supplements to help gastritis? Mm. Supplements are individualized. And that for the person most part. saying, oh. I got gastritis after the colonoscopy. Ooh. Mm -hmm. So gastritis is inflammation of the stomach. And so mm. when the stomach is really irritable, I like to say things that are very soothing to inflammation. So I like to use things like um, mus mus mucilenic herbs, um, mucilogenic herbs uh, and foods rather. So things like aloe vera, mm -hmm. cactus, um, okra. okra, as long as these don't cause bloating for the person, Chia. marshmallow root, licorice root, DGL. I love just a straight L-glutamine as well. If somebody does have a lot of bloating with some of those other foods that I recommended, I love L-glutamine, you guys. It's If you're somebody who's very sensitive, I love using just straight L-glutamine powder. I find so many of my patients are like, oh man, that L-glutamine makes me feel really good, especially if they have inflammation. Because think of it, inflammation will, it's like a little fire. A small controlled amount of fire is good and can do good things, but if it's out of control fire, it can cause damage and it can cause inflammation in the lining of the stomach, the esophagus, small intestine. Mm -hmm. So L-glutamine helps to kind of do some repair. So I'm a big fan of that. But yeah, some of those um, herbs that have that kind of um, mucigenic effect. And then also identify if you need any support with making more stomach acid as well, because sometimes gastritis will affect the output of stomach acid and then your tolerance of it. So those... Things that help with motility can be helpful as well. But yeah, 
I would say that would be a good option. Yes. Great questions, everybody. And this was great. And thank you to our Good Gut members for bringing up this topic. Again, specialized topic, but hey, it'll live on our, our YouTube. If you know anyone who's like, oh man, they were mentioning the elemental diet, send them the video. And you can find that on the Mary Toth YouTube, marytoth.com. So we appreciate all of you. Um, it's been wonderful to check in for another Good Gut Live. Keep in mind, every month we do our dietitian talk once a month and our Good Gut Live and more to come. We have some exciting mm -hmm. things. Make sure you're on our email list. Go to marytoth.com, click on our email list. You can click the link in bio of any social media site you're on to be on our email list. So you're staying up to date with our 100% plant-based SIBO IBS program that is relaunching. So you're staying up to date with our regenerative health initiative that we're launching and really cool things we're doing there. We are trying to merge the world of healthy regenerative agriculture as well as family, food, and farming all together in this beautiful new world where we can all heal with each meal. Mm -hmm. so, Hi, Lizzie. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everybody for tuning in and we'll talk to you very soon. We hope you have a healing day and you continue to heal with each meal. We'll see you next time. Let us know if there's a specific topic that you are dying for us to talk about too. All right. Talk to you Bye, all everybody. soon.